Charlie Munger, the slow, the steady, and the savvy investor. Charles Munger interview, take one. Everybody walks into successes and failures in their days. Some consider it as an event. Some take it as themselves. How are you handling such circumstances? As Confucius states, our greatest glory is not in never falling, but in rising every time we fall. Okay, but how many times can a person go through it? Charlie Munger replies to this with his life. By the age of 31, Munger walked down three major turning points in his life. He got divorced was completely broke and burying his nine-year-old son who died of cancer. Yet at the age of 69, Munger had been on the list of 400 richest people in the world, married again, had eight children and many grandchildren. Munger is considered to be a great asset in the investing world. One can neatly pin this Latin phrase, ad astra per aspera, next to Charlie Munger's name. This means the man who fought through adversity to the stars. He didn't just survive through bad days, but continually thrived. Munger is described as the right-hand man and the closest partner of Warren Buffett for more than 55 years. When I first met Warren, I recognized immediately that he was a very intelligent person. And of course, he was interested in the subject that I was also interested in, which was the process of being a successful investor. His well-known line in the money world is this, Remember that reputation and integrity are your most valuable assets and can be lost in a heartbeat. Very few have known Munger's personal life or about his life in any articles. Having an array of profound experience as a businessman, as an architectural designer, as a former real estate attorney, as a philanthropist, and as a billionaire investor, still, Munger always had his foot on the ground. What makes him flourish in all these spheres? He signifies it to his reading habit. An avid reader of great historical authors, he shares that reading books makes him think, analyze his work, paint strategies, dissect a want and a need to perceive his infallibility in major decisions and to significantly measure his investment thinking. To him, a day without any reflective reading is a day wasted. So here is Charlie Munger. From the state of Nebraska, Omaha, Munger was born in a family that had a lineage in the legal profession. His father was a lawyer, his grandfather a district court judge, and the then state representative of Nebraska. As a teenager, he worked at a grocery store, Buffett & Son, owned by the grandfather of Warren Buffett. We both came from Omaha. We both worked in his, his grandfather's grocery store. He enrolled in the University of Michigan to pursue a study in mathematics, but he discontinued it after his 19th birthday to serve in the U.S. Army Air Corps. There he was promoted as a second lieutenant, in his Army General Classification test, Munger obtained high scores, and for further studies, he was instructed to take up meteorology at Caltech in Pasadena, California. He pursued a number of advanced courses through the benefit scheme for World War II veterans. He applied for Harvard Law School, his father's alma mater, but his application was rejected, as he had not completed his bachelor's degree. However, Munger's family friend, the reputed Roscoe Pound, a former dean of Harvard Law School, gave a call to support his application to the law school. Munger was admitted. He excelled and finished law with a JD in 1948, graduated with magna cum laude. Munger was a member of Harvard Legal Aid Bureau, the oldest student-run legal services office in the United States, which was founded in 1913. Munger's Investment History in 1962, Munger started and worked as a real estate attorney at Munger, Tolls & Olson LLP. Later, he forewent his law practice to focus on managing investments. This led him to partner with Otis Booth in real estate development. Further, he partnered with Jack Wheeler. With him, he founded the Wheeler, Munger & Company an investment firm. It had a seat in the Pacific Coast Stock Exchange. Years down the line, he waived this firm too, in 1976, after consecutive losses of 32% and 31% in 1973 and 1974. Munger's own investment partnership brought a compound annual return of 19.8% in the period of 1962 to 1975. When analyzed with Dow, which had a 5% of annual appreciation rate, previously functioned as chairman of the Wesco Financial Corporation from 1984 to 2011, which is presently a subsidiary of Berkshire Hathaway. It was commenced as a saving and loan association, but eventually controlled many ventures. To name a few, the CORT Furniture Leasing, Precision Steel Corps, and the Kansas Bankers Surety Company. 
Wesco Financials held an amazing equity portfolio of over 1.5 billion US dollars. Its portfolio had eminent organizations like Procter & Gamble, Goldman Sachs, Kraft Foods, Coca-Cola, US Bancorp, and Wells Fargo. Coca-Cola. Still, if you take the amount of Coca-Cola drunk in the world in the main flavor, it's one hell of a brand. At Wesco's annual shareholders meeting, generally, investors throng to hear Munger's wisdom. Munger interacts for a substantial time with Wesco's investment community, giving his thoughts on the future investment prospects, emerging methods in investments, at times speculating what would Benjamin Franklin do in the given circumstances. He is the chairman of the Daily Journal Corporation at LA, also the vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway, the conglomerate governed by Warren Buffett, a longtime business partner and the confidant of Warren Buffett. Munger is the director of Costco Wholesale Corporation. His net worth is estimated at $1.9 billion as of this 2021 January. So, what were Charlie Munger's famous investment philosophies? Baseline, he strongly looks at long-term value investing. Firstly, he declares, all intelligent investing is value investing, means factors like product moats, financial statements, services, policies, and other aspects which determine a business success are far more imperative than everyday share price variations. All intelligent investment is value investment. Because why would you want to buy something which wasn't worth as much as you were paying for it? And who wouldn't like buying something for less than it's worth? Secondly, a great business at a fair price is superior to a fair business at a great price. He emphasizes that a company's quality must be analyzed before making any investment decisions and consider its value only after finding if it's a company worth investing in. Thirdly, people calculate too much and think too little, says Munger. One must obviously delve deep into a company's vision, the management team, the financial statements, the balance sheet, the culture of the company, and its competitiveness in the market. He underlines with bright colors that there is more to a business than just the hard numbers. Fourth, the investor must have a vivid picture of what he's getting into. Know how the company you have chosen is making profits. According to him, Berkshire Hathaway has three baskets for investing. Yes, no, and too complicated. Its comprehension is that one has to mainly focus on the market he knows well. If you are unclear in knowing how the business functions, or why the company is valued the way it is, it's wise to move on. Fifth, take caution in every step in this untrodden path. If the possessed knowledge is limited in this investing subject, seek out skilled people who can guide you. He says, knowing what you don't know is more useful than being brilliant. Sixth, Munger values the virtue patience. The big money is not in the buying or selling, he says, but in the waiting. The key to wealth creation is staying invested in the market with a long-term strategy and not to be worked up by brief cyclical crashes. Seventh, he believes that opportunities come rarely and at such times the wise investor keeps his money at reach so that he doesn't chase mediocre opportunities. He points out that it takes character to be seated with all that cash and not be doing anything. Eighth, the investor must challenge his decisions on investing with strong opposing opinions too. That would help him to see not only what could go wrong but also what he has missed seeing. Ninth, he expresses envy, resentment, revenge, and self-pity are disastrous modes of thought. Early investor has his days of loss or ideas drained down the hole. But that need not be the end of the world. He must quickly let go of the loss and focus on new investments with the lessons learned. In this way, one becomes an overcomer and instills courage to implement more brilliantly. Last but not least, the greatest investment is knowledge, which always has high returns. He encourages them to read every day and especially on a variety of subjects which they are passionate about, because one can light up fabulous ideas from any subject. He adds another perspective using mental models to assess the investment culture, an individual's behavior, mental errors, character qualities, and emotional processes habitually curb investment decisions. All financial decisions are done on impulse. Having an in-depth understanding of mental models will aid you to know how our biases influence our decisions. In one of his speeches about mental models, he said, you've got to have models in your head, and you've got to array your experience, both vicarious and direct, on this lattice work of models. You may have noticed students who just try to remember and pound back what is remembered. Well, they fail in school and in life. You've got to hang experience on a lattice work of models in your head. All this lines up in a single line as his guiding principle. 
This is preparation, decisiveness, discipline, and patience. He is quite known for minting a new term. Lollapalooza Effect, in 1995, while speaking at Harvard, titled The Psychology of Human Misjudgment, he explains that the basis of this Lollapalooza Effect is that humans have various innate predispositions and inclinations that can collectively influence and impact one's behavior. When several of these prejudices being acts in a collected manner that eventually drives toward a particular action, it is called as Lollapalooza Effect. He used the open auction event as a metaphor. The entire drive in an open auction is based on people trying to validate their worth in public to gratify themselves. The inner compulsion for proving their social status as high in public view and inclined to buy anything in the auction to impress their own ego and mark their presence. So why this effect is applied in financial market? It's otherwise known as the herd mentality. People with less knowledge sway based on any influential crowd's move. If they see an influential crowd swelling, immediately the herd is inclined to sell, or if the crowd is buying, then the herd is into buying. Hence, it is wise to check on psychological factors in the investing game. Another approach is his checklist. He implements his own rules based on his requirements. He uses checklists to make an investment decision. He advocates investors ought to be rational in thinking, organized, practical and prepared to be a success in the investing realm. Each investor's checklist will vary based on need and their knowledge of the investing company. There can never be a common for all checklist and it's best for investors to design their own template. Remember, checklists evolve by time and clever checklists are designed by rational thinkers. Poor Charlie's Almanac is the biography of Charlie Munger. It consolidates his investing thoughts and philosophies. Munger's Personal Tragedy While studying at Caltech in 1945, Munger married Nancy Huggins, had three children. By 1953, their marriage was badly swaying. They divorced and Nancy Huggins kept the family home in South Pasadena. Shortly after this, Charlie was informed that his youngest child, Teddy, suffered from leukemia. Those were the days where health insurance wasn't available and everything was settled from pocket. He faced dreadful conditions at the university club and drove a poor yellow Pontiac. A friend of Munger, Rick Gurren, says, Munger would go into the hospital, hold his young son, and then walk the streets of Pasadena crying. A year later, after the diagnosis, his son passed away at the age of nine. Munger was just 31 years old. Divorced, broke, and burying his young son was more than a lot to take. Two years later, he remarried Nancy Berry, with whom he had four children and two stepchildren. Later in his 50s, he had a failed eye cataract surgery that reduced his left eye blind, and it was removed due to its pain. It didn't stop here. He developed a condition in which he was to lose his right eye also, and doctors informed him that the high possibility of blindness was nearing. This didn't deter his spirit. He started to take braille lessons. However, the condition receded and he is able to see with his right eye. All these hard lessons of life made Munger hold two principles in life. One, never feel sorry for yourself. Two, never have envy. Charlie abhors victim mentality. His stand on adversity is that assume life will be really tough and then ask yourself if you can handle it. If the answer is yes, you've won. Bill Gates once referred to Munger as the broadest thinker he has ever encountered. Buffett, having worked with Munger for more than 55 years, has mentioned that Munger chose only to work with the people who can be trusted, stands as a testimony to Munger's honesty and authenticity. Munger relishes architecture. He has helped to design dormitories at Stanford University and the University of Michigan, as well as the house he currently inhabits. He advocates against gerrymandering and helps to intensify political competition. Unlike Bill Gates or Warren Buffett, Munger donates more to the affluent universities that groom the bright ones. Educational institutions that received large donations from Munger's are the University of Michigan Law School, Marlboro School in Los Angeles, University of Michigan, Stanford University, University of California, Santa Barbara. In 2014, Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics was constituted a whopping $65 million, the largest gift in any educational institution. He did not want to sign the giving pledge that was initiated by Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, thus the life of the humblest investor, Charlie Munger. Through life's maelstroms, he footed himself firmly on the ground that enriched his virtues. His life experiences, resilience, perspectives on a variety of things, all that he advocates for in the investing world was not just mere words, but he lived it. See you soon with another financial personality. Hey all, thank you for watching till the end. Do like and share. Keep watching our videos. Subscribe for more financial documentaries. It's Chow from FinDoc and team.